Previously on Retro Game On, all the way back in January, I released part one of my Atari 2600 Junior Repair. In that 18 minute video, I replaced some burnt out and sus components, did a full recap, bunch of cleaning, and a lot of other stuff, but ultimately wasn't able to get it working. I do however recommend watching that before you watch this, since there is a lot of general troubleshooting that may help you with your own Atari if that's the reason you're watching. Regardless, I ended on the cliffhanger of ordering a TIA chip and left it at that. Today, 10 months later, I'm happy to finally show you the finished product. Yes, I did fix it, I'll let you know that now because this is looking to be a decently long video, so strap yourself in, pour yourself a drink, and come with me now on the journey of finally fixing this Atari 2600 Junior, which I've owned since 2011. Shortly after I finished part 1, the TIA arrived, which I bought as new old stock. These are frankly quite expensive, as they're getting rarer and rarer. I paid something like $40 for this. The plan is to mount it into a socket, because that's where ICs belong. So to begin, let's remove the old TIA. I've shown my desoldering process on here quite a few times, but for those who haven't seen it, I first like to flux up the solder points, before then resoldering them. I then pulled out my trusty $40 Chinese desoldering vacuum pump and got to work removing every single blob. I honestly can't stress enough how great this thing is for desoldering. If I was sitting there with braid or god forbid a just a handheld pump, I think I'd be there all night. It took a few rounds and then ultimately a bit of cleaning up with desoldering braid, but eventually she was removed. After a bit more tidying up with some braid and additional cleaning with isopropyl alcohol, I got to work installing the IC socket. And now because there is a socket, it is very easy to install the chip. Watching back on this footage now, I'm surprised by how easy it goes in. Spoiler alert, there is quite a bit of IC swapping in this video, and none of them went in as easy as this one. So, I'm excited, I've installed the new chip which I've waited a few weeks to arrive, and it's finally time for the big moment. Will it work? Mmm, no. Apparently not it would seem. I'm not even getting the flashing screen like I did before. Okay, after reseating the cartridge I did get the flashing, so we're back to where we were before. But this console, sadly, is still not fixed. Honestly, this pissed me off, because I thought that was definitely going to fix the issue, which is why there is such a large gap between part 1 and this video. So I gave the project a bit of a rest. Eventually, someone commented on part 1 that they had the same issue with their console, and it was fixed by cleaning the power switch. Well, I cleaned and cleaned the switch off camera beforehand, so I figured I would just remove it completely, and try this very bodgy temporary solution to see if anything would change. And no, the answer is no, but it was worth a try. After this, I decided I would desolder and reseat the original chips into their own sockets. In this clip here, I only had the IC socket for the one size, so I couldn't do the 6507. But, as you can imagine, reseating the 6532 did not change the outcome. So, I then turned my attention back to the cartridge slot. I completely desoldered it, and gave the contacts a good clean with a toothbrush and IPA. Inspecting it after it was clean, there were a few pads that looked a bit sus, but after resoldering the module, nothing changed. So I then went and bought some IC sockets for the 6507 and reseated that as well. It looks like I didn't film the outcome, but as you can imagine, this also did not fix the issue. So I decided it was finally time to start swapping ICs from a working console. Which, as you can imagine, is a bit of a risky endeavour. And let's just preface by saying this is the beginning of the end for this poor working 2600. Sorry bud. To begin, I decided by swapping the 6532, and as with the other console, I decided to install these in sockets as well. I just think it's generally good practice. So I swapped in the working 6532, tested that all the connections were indeed connecting, and turned her on. And... Nothing. It would seem at this point in time that the 6532 is not the culprit. The flashing screen. It still taunts me. So, the last possible troubleshooting option at this point was the 6507. And this is when disaster struck. I used a very simple IC extraction tool to remove these ICs. And while I didn't have any issues beforehand, the smaller form factor of the 6507 took me off guard. Unfortunately, I didn't grip it properly, and the extractor slipped, scratching a huge scar right through the middle of the 6507. 
You can kind of see it here and I guess it doesn't look that bad. But ultimately, this bricked the 6507. I now had two non-working 2600s. As you can imagine, this made me a very sad boy. So I took another short break from the project. But eventually, I got the courage to type my way onto eBay and I bought replacement chips. I figured I'd buy a replacement 6532 and a 6507 since they weren't actually that expensive, a lot cheaper than the TIA. Both of them were less than $10 each from China. So during these trying times for the postal service, it took about three weeks for the chip to arrive, which honestly isn't that out of the ordinary for China anyway. To begin, I started by swapping over just the 6507, since it did seem the likely culprit at this point. And... Nah. Still that flashing screen. So, I put in the new 6532 instead. And guess what? Still a flashing screen. <laughs> so at this point, I was pretty gobsmacked. I'd replaced all three chips and it still wasn't working. What is going on? Well, I was sitting there watching some YouTube, as you can imagine I do quite a lot of, and I was watching a great channel called This Does Not Compute. In this latest video, he was repairing his Apple IIe, and in that, he mentioned counterfeit chips that the Chinese sell. Apparently, you can tell if they're fake or not by spraying IPA on the top and giving it a good scrub. As a general rule, if the text scrubs away with the IPA, it means it's a fake. So I gave this a go since IPA is back to being quite cheap, and no, the text didn't rub away. So as far as I was concerned at this point, they were not fake. So I got down with the laborious task of checking if every IC pin connected with their respected socket. Through my findings, I found two pins that I'd accidentally bridged. Usually I hold my soldering to a higher standard than that, but in this case, I was relieved to find a fault. So a bit of desoldering and resoldering later, and we're hopefully back in business. Well, not exactly. However... <laughs> I'm really bummed after all this time I didn't catch the moment on film but I've continuously been trying to tune it into the VCR and you know that was working with the other one before so I'm not really sure what's going on there maybe the VCR needs to be factory reset but it occurred to me I've got all brand new chips in maybe I should at least try and tune it into another display and the colors are a little bit wrong obviously they're supposed to be more of a red and black from memory when I was working on the, the other Atari but um yeah, it appears to be working, and I guess I should probably... This is through coax, by the way, and then I'll, I guess I'll try composite 2, and then I'll start swapping chips around again, and you know, we'll be able to figure out what exactly is wrong, which chip is the bum one. Very exciting. Okay, so I've spent the last half an hour or so swapping chips uh, between both consoles and also within the consoles themselves, and I've come to a few conclusions. Um, first off, for the original one that's broken... The composite does not work at all. You see one of the wires here has actually come undone from the constant fiddling around of the circuit board itself. So I'll have to give that a good look, make sure I've wired everything up correctly and that there's continuity and whatnot. Um, two, with this, it appears that both the, the 6532s and the 6507s were both kaput originally. Um, and as I've said, I've replaced all three chips in this Atari now. It's basically a new Atari. So I'm beginning to think that maybe a... Originally, before I received it sometime in 2011, maybe someone put the wrong power supply in and just fried everything. Because if you remember from the first video, there were a few other components on there that were fried and a, bit traces that, a few traces that were looking a bit sad. So... Kind of coming to that conclusion, not sure about the TIA, I haven't bothered pulling out the original TIA and cleaning it up and straightening the pins to see if this will work or not. I don't really care at this point. I'm just happy to see it working. Now, talking about this working, that brings me back to the other Atari, the one which I broke. Um, trying both the CPU and the six, the, I keep forgetting what it's called, the 6532 in that, 
it still doesn't work. It just tunes to static. I can't see any sort of image at all or anything to indicate that it's actually, you know, taking data from the cartridge and processing it. Processing it. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. I might just have to double check the, um, uh, double check the, um, double check the IC sockets. Sorry, just had a bit of a mind freeze there for a second. Uh, but the chips actually do look different. They've stamped with the same codes, but they're from a different manufacturer. So I'll have to do a bit of research into that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure if, uh, you know, I can mix and match these chips. Having a look at buying the chips online, I can't see the other manufacturer anywhere. They, they seem to be manufactured in Thailand and Mexico. So, yeah, well, that's, uh, that's what I'm up to so far. Anyway, I'm just going to go back to focusing on the original Atari. Maybe I can figure out the one I broke another day. But right now, I just want to work on making the image a little bit better and also making sure the colors are correct. There's a few potentiometers on the board, so I might just have a bit of a, a, bit of a fiddle around with those. Further testing of Frogger seemed to indicate that the colors were displaying properly. However, there was no sound. Also, for some reason on this more modern TV, every time I turned it off, it would go out of tune by 0.1 of a megahertz or something like that. So I switched to the CRT from this point onwards where it stayed in tune. Also, please excuse the fact that the TV is currently on the ground. I'm in the process of some very long-term reorganization of the gaming room. So back to the sound problem. There are a couple of adjustment potentiometers built into the board and one of those is for sound. This one in particular was moved quite a bit in original troubleshooting just to see if I could get anything out of it. So I figured this was definitely out of tune. And lo and behold, after a while, we had sound again. Although there was still quite a bit of background noise still. I'll take it. After much fiddling, I think that's about as good as it's going to get. The image quality looks pretty good. I think any sort of static at this point is purely because of RF and not because of anything going wrong on the console. So I'm pretty happy with the sound and the video I have now. I can go back into figuring out the, uh, the composite. So I pulled up the original tutorial for the composite mod online, which I will link in the description if you want to read it for yourself, although be warned it is in German. And after much head scratching off camera, I thought I had wired it wrong. But then after a bit more head scratching, I realized I hadn't wired it wrong and I put it back to the way it originally was and then it mysteriously started working. I'm not sure exactly where the problem was, but I guess there was a dry solder point or something like that. So with all the technical stuff out of the way, we can look to the cosmetic stuff, starting with this incredibly gross, rusty RF shield. I did a decent chunk of research online on the best way to remove rust from RF shields, and the best solution I found that was mentioned time and time again was sanding it with wet and dry sandpaper while it's in a tub of distilled white vinegar. I guess I probably should have used gloves while doing this since I was submersing my hands in rusty vinegar, but who knows, maybe the vinegar instantly neutralizes it. Either way, I haven't died of tetanus yet. And honestly, the results are night and day. In fact, I could see a difference right as I started doing it. Sure, the RF shields aren't back to perfect quality, but all that rust is gone, and ultimately, it's just something that's going to sit inside of the console anyway. I just really didn't want the rust spreading. So then I turned my attention to the plastic casing of the console itself. As per usual, I was just going to give these a good scrub in hot soapy water. So to begin, we needed to completely disassemble it. The bottom piece is a hole anyway, so that's okay, but there are some buttons in the top half. The power and TV type slider buttons were fairly easy to remove. These are simply held in by clips, and while it is a bit nerve wracking to squeeze them out, they came out intact. The select and reset buttons were a bit more tricky. These have clips as well, but the way they're so tightly connected to the console means that they do need to be forced out quite violently. I was super paranoid I was going to break them during this process, but remarkably, they stayed intact. These have a bunch of conductive film at the back, and with age, this material is starting to disintegrate. After those two are removed, it's very easy to remove the ribbon cable. And, as you can see, the conductive pads are totally gone, which is definitely a bummer. 
Honestly, I don't see this as too essential to this repair today, but I will look at repairing it or replacing it in a future video. And from there, it was time to rub a dub dub. And honestly, this is not as filthy compared to some of the other stuff I've cleaned here in the past. Some stuff has been straight up gross. It was a bit manky in the grooves and there was a bit of loose debris, but otherwise, it cleaned up quite easily. Really, it was the easiest part of this whole repair. So after giving everything a rinse with clean water and reinstalling the buttons, it was finally time for full reassembly. Well, nearly. For some reason overnight, this really weird discoloration formed in all the RF shielding. It came off with the touch of a finger, so I decided to give all the RF shields a final one over with steel wool. As you can imagine, this left quite a mess. I've had a lot of gross stuff on this map before, but never any rust. It was now time to turn my attention back to the composite mod. So far, I just had the one yellow output for video and one single audio output. Unfortunately, it seems that a stereo mod is not possible on PAL consoles. So instead, I'm just splitting the mono output between two plugs. There was a very small issue I didn't really capture on film where the sound was coming out really quietly. This just appeared to be a grounding issue, however, and with both plugs installed, the sound is really loud and clear. And there's no more fuzz in the background either. With that done, it was finally time to properly install the sockets. This required desoldering them temporarily and then drilling some holes into the side of the case, which is always fun. I'm usually a bit more thorough with my measuring out for these plugs, but in this case, I sort of just winged it and even though they could be a little bit more straight, I think they turned out okay. And with that, it was finally time to reassemble this for the final time. And yes, I totally forgot to reinstall the RF shield after all that cleaning. Frankly, it probably wouldn't fit anyway now with the composite mod, and I don't really need it anyway since I'm not using RF. I also forgot to plug in the ribbon cable, but since the contacts on that are bunk anyway, I guess it doesn't really matter. And with that, we're done. That was quite a journey, wasn't it? It is a bummer about the contacts. There are a few games I can't play at the moment because you need to hit the select button to start. But playing games like E.T. where that's not required shows that the console is in a fully working state otherwise. It is also a shame about the other Atari console. I went from having one working console and one broken console, and at the end of all this, I still have one working console and one broken console. It's just that their roles are now reversed. Honestly, I'm not really sure why the new chips weren't working in it, especially the 6507, which was very obviously the broken one, but I assume it has something to do with the IC sockets I installed. There's probably a dry point or two connecting pins like there was with this console. Anyway, that is it for this video. Thank you very much for watching all the way through. I am certainly happy to have this project at completion. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.